So joining me uh, here in the LA office is Rick Kelly, our Vice President of Client Services. Hi everyone. Uh, Rick has spent most of his career in the market research industry working closely with clients and operations teams to ensure client needs are met. Um, I don't think that this bio does uh, enough justice to all the things that Rick does here at the office, but we're very excited to have him on nonetheless. Thanks, Brandon. Look forward to talking to everyone in a few minutes. Great. So then with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, the main presenter for today's webinar, uh, Adam Tuporek, customer service expert. Adam, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your history in the CX space, etc. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. So excited to talk with you today. We've got some fantastic concepts that I think are going to help you think differently about customer service and help you make immediate improvements in your customer experience. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. I'm a customer service author, keynote speaker, and the owner and founder of CTS Service Solutions, a workshop and training company specializing in high-energy customer service workshops. And one of our promises at CTS is to help you think differently about customer service. So some of the formal credentials real quickly, I have two business degrees, have an MBA, a certificate in customer experience, and I'm also a net promoter certified associate. However, the background I think that is most relevant to our discussion today is that I'm a third generation entrepreneur. And as a small business owner, I've always been close to the action and seen what it takes to make customer experience work in a world of limited budgets and resources. Now, part of that business experience is based on over a decade in franchising and retail service concepts, where I've been responsible for overseeing a network with over 600 employees and over $20 million in annual sales. And I think this gives me a unique lens to see both the on-the-ground small business perspective and the challenges of delivering customer experience at scale. So let's take a quick look at what we're going to talk about today. And you'll see there might be a little lag between when I introduce a slide and when it hits for you. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at the traditional journey mapping process. Then we're going to talk about how we can hack that process for quick, effective results. And we'll do this using a concept I call overlays, which are based on psychology and my concept of the seven service triggers. Then Rick will come back on and talk with you about how you can use community in your customer experience design. And finally, we'll have a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So let's get started. One of the primary lessons I've taken away through my work in small business, in franchising, and as a customer service trainer is this. Complexity is the enemy of action. When an initiative or process becomes too complex, what happens? Nothing. It rolls out, it gets partially done, and of course, it just fades away. Now, in fact, Ken Blanchard, the famous management guru, had his team study change initiatives. And while they didn't look specifically at customer service or customer experience initiatives, they found that 70% of all corporate initiatives fail. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that, and if you study change management at all, you know things like structure and buy-in are important. But one thing that's not talked about as often is complexity and our penchant for simple solutions. So we're going to talk about something called cognitive biases in a few minutes. But there's a cognitive bias that informs this idea of us shunning complexity. And it's called the triviality bias. And it means we would rather tackle a small, digestible, unimportant issue than a large, important issue that is hard to get our arms around. And there's actually a term for this that's called bike shedding. So you've probably heard about Parkinson's law, and that's the, the pretty funny law that work expands to fill the time allotted for its completion. And certainly, if you've ever been in management, you know that is true. Now, the same Parkinson came up with the law of triviality. And he used a metaphor of a committee's deliberations. And he described a committee with uh, two agenda items. One was the construction of a new nuclear reactor or plant for $28 million. And the other was a $1,000 bicycle shed for the staff. So in Parkinson's concept, he says that the nuclear reactor is approved in two and a half minutes because it's simply too big and it's too technical and people just rubber stamp it. The bike shed, on the other hand, people can wrap their heads around. So they spend 45 minutes discussing the shed, what type of roof it should have, what color, and then they table it for further discussion. And this is called bike shedding, focusing on the smaller, unimportant projects because they're manageable. Now the lesson a lot of people take away from this is to remember to focus on the important and not the trivial. But I say let's not fight human nature any more than we have to. 
I say if we know that people will gravitate towards simple challenges and solutions and will fail to act on larger complex issues, why don't we simplify the issue itself? Now let me state for the record emphatically, yes, business is complex, customer experience can be complicated, and sometimes we just have to hunker down and face that complexity head on. But I'm an 80-20 guy. If we can get 80% of the way there by focusing on 20% of the inputs, better yet, if we can get 90% of the way there, and better still, if it actually gets done, then that's the way to go. So today, I want to introduce you to another way. To approach your customer journey, it's a quick shortcut how you can prove your touch points in weeks, not months and years. So let's make sure we're on the same page first. Let's talk about what a touch point is. Now, touch points are any place where a customer intersects with your brand. And touch points are the individual parts of that thing we call the customer experience or journey. So here are a few examples, objects or physical objects. And this is just a way to look at it. There's a million ways for the record. Uh, but objects are physical objects you can hold in your hand or possess, like a catalog or a product, or if it's digital, an email or a brochure or a PDF. Uh, spaces, this is an environment where the customer goes. So it might be a retail store in the physical world or a website or a community forum in cyberspace. Service, these are intangible, cannot be picked up, carried away, or stored, so a haircut is a service. So is cloud storage. People, that's pretty obvious, it's any interaction with humans, whether it's face-to-face, -face, by Skype or chat, or in a moderated community. And reputational and external, these can include word of mouth, Yelp reviews, social media. These are touch points as well, but they're the ones that are least in your control. So that was just a quick guide to help you understand the concept of a touch point and that every interaction with your brand is a touch point. But when I discuss customer journey mapping and touch points, I have a saying I use. And it's everything is important, but everything is not equally important. So today, when we talk about touch points, I want you to think about the big touch points that drive the experience the most. For instance, providing the actual service or the issue resolution process, as opposed to, say, the marketing flyer or what your Facebook masthead looks like. I call these key touch points pressure points. They're the big touch points that make or break the experience. So let's talk about how these touch points fit into the overall customer experience. Uh, I'm certain you've probably heard of customer journey mapping. So let's just briefly touch on the traditional approach to customer journey mapping. Oh, one second. Okay, here's a picture of a typical journey mapping process. And the goal is to do what's called a touch point inventory and essentially map out all of our customers' journey with our brand. And lots of time that starts in a room with people and a whole lot of post-it notes. And here's the thing, the more complicated your business model, the more complicated the map. But even simple models can have extremely complex maps. So with journey mapping, what I found is one of its greatest strengths is also one of its greatest weaknesses. Because it can give you a comprehensive, thorough look at your customer experience, but it can also really allow you to go down the rabbit hole really far. You know, as a thought exercise once, I, I created a nine-step journey map for a gumball machine in a retail store. So when you're using a journey map to enhance your customer experience, it can be complicated. It can have a lot of moving parts, and it can be hard to make it actionable. So as an example, here's a finished journey map for a rail company. So a fairly simple model, but a deep map. Is this actionable? Yes. Is it quickly and easily actionable? Well, that's where we find a challenge. So I ask myself, how can we hack this process? How can we look at the customer journey in a different way? So let me ask you this. If I asked you right now, could you name the top three or five most important touch points, the make or break pressure points that you have to get right in your organization? Could you? I bet you could. And so what if we took those touch points and used 80-20 concepts to help us improve each touch point quicker and more effectively? So the idea is this, first make the touch point great for everyone, then make it great for the individual. And to do this, I use a concept I call overlays. Now the concept of overlays can be summed up by that old trope from politics, that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. And it's true, we talk a lot about personalization and customization in customer experience, and that is super important. But while we're all individuals, we are also alike in a lot of ways. So instead of building out customer personas and personalization, journey hacking is about looking at common psychological principles, in most cases what are called cognitive biases, and the seven service triggers, which is a concept I developed, and looking at how organizations can quickly improve touch points and journeys 
by using these overlays as a construct. So let's start with psychology. Excuse me, I think I just hit the wrong button. One second there. Forgive me, this thing, the mouse is a little jumpy here. All right, so every experience we create is inevitably filtered through that imperfect organ called the brain. So it behooves us as customer experience leaders to understand how the brain works. Now the great news is that we live in the golden age of psychology. We've learned more about the human brain and human behavior in the last few decades than in probably all of human history before that. Now the not so great news is that one of the biggest things we've learned from all this knowledge is that human beings are hardwired to be irrational, for our brains to take shortcuts. So you see, customers are irrational, and if we can understand the ways in which they are irrational, we can design our customer experiences accordingly. So as much as society and digital technology have rapidly evolved in the past few years, our brains have evolved much more slowly. Put it very bluntly, we still have caveman brains in many ways. We're still designed to look for a lack or attack, for scarcity or threat. And that makes sense because it wasn't that long ago that we needed to know if that noise in the bushes was a bunny or a tiger. And we're wired to make these immediate split-second judgments. And one of those judgments is first impressions. Now, we all know anecdotally that first impressions are important, but there's solid evidence to support a few things. One is that we form first impressions very rapidly, and two, that we form them subconsciously. In 2009, neuroscientists at New York University and Harvard identified the neural systems involved in forming first impressions. And they found that when someone meets us, they make judgments about 11 things. I'll give you a second to look at those. So when customers come into our business, they're doing the same thing with our people and with our brand. They're looking at cleanliness, how the staff is dressed, how they are greeted. On the phone, they're listening to the tone of the operator, how logical the phone tree is. Digitally, they're looking at how our site looks, how easy information is to find. They're looking at everything and taking in every message. All right, so what's another mental shortcut that impacts our customer touch points? Let's talk about the peak end rule. All right, the peak end rule is a psychological heuristic, or basically rule, in which people judge an experience largely based on how they felt at its most intense point and at its end. So rather than judging on the total experience, it's the peak and the end. So how does this affect our touch points? When you're lo looking at your touch points, you have to close strong. And when we take into account first impressions in the peak end rule, that means at each touch point, you need to focus on the bookends, how it starts and how it ends. Now what about the peak? I get this question a lot. Well, how can we control what the most intense moment of the experience is? And my answer is usually, exactly. That's exactly the question you want to ask, just with a more positive intention. If you know the customer is going to be most affected by the emotional high or low at a touch point, why leave it to chance any more than you have to? Plan that wow moment right into the touch point. Design a moment that's going to impact them. Now, wow doesn't mean elaborate or expensive. I went to a Johnny Rockets once, and the waiter drew like a little smiley face uh, and ketchup on the plate. Now, I don't remember what I ate that day, but I do remember the smiley face. It was a very simple gesture. So whatever it may be, look at your touch point and ask yourself how you can construct an emotional peak in advance. What can you do that is memorable and will create a positive experience that stands out for the customer? Next, make sure you identify the negative peaks, so to speak, the emotional lows, and eliminate those. And when we get to the seven service triggers in a few minutes, that process will help immensely with that. All right, so the next psychological principle is framing. Okay, and first quick note, I put priming there in parentheses to let you know that it's closely related to framing, and it's something you should keep in mind when you're approaching touch points. However, we have pretty short time together and a lot to get through, so we're just going to focus on framing today. Framing is how you present something, the language you use to get a desired effect. And on your screen is a classic example. People will rate the positively framed one better than the negatively framed one, even though they mean the same thing. The classic study asked about 90% lean beef or 10% fat. The lean was considered to have higher expected quality and taste. Same thing, different framing. Now this principle is extremely important in customer service. How many of you have seen signs or ads, no refunds after 14 days, we don't take American Express? Now those messages are immediately negative. They send a signal to the customer about what they can't do and how you are limiting their freedom and choice. And these messages are everywhere. When we look at our touch point, when we look at our communication, everything from our signage to our greeting, 
ask yourself if we are framing in a way that will create the most positive experience. For instance, what if no refunds after 14 days was, we will happily accept refunds within 14 days after purchase. Or if you really wanted to like pile on the sugar, because we know that things happen, we offer an extended refund period of up to 14 days after purchase. What if we don't take American Express became, to keep prices low for you, we have chosen Visa and MasterCard as our credit card partners for all purchases. Now you hear the difference the framing makes? So when we look at all these cyclical mechanisms and biases, we want to realize that all of these things are happening in the background in our customers' minds. And we want to design around them. And we want to actively direct them over time. And here's where community engagement can really provide a powerful antidote to these psychological biases. Let's take first impressions as an example. We've all seen the movie where the boy and the girl meet the first time, and you know it's a complete train wreck, it's a horrible first meeting, but eventually by the end of the movie they live happily ever after. You see, first impressions and confirmation bias, for instance, which confirms the first impression, are powerful, and if left alone, you sort of get what you get. But if you engage with your customers, either directly or through a community, and you can regularly provide new inputs, you can help confirm positive experiences and attitudes or begin to counteract negative experiences and attitudes. You can try to rewire the script in your customer's head. All right, so let's move on to the seven service triggers. So the seven service triggers, essentially we are wired to avoid pain, another psychological mechanism, so we create associations. And the classic is the touching of the hot stove, right? Now, the foundation of the seven service triggers was built upon the idea that our customers do not come to us as a blank slate. Even if they are new to our business, they've had experiences with companies like ours before, and these experiences, for better or worse, have shaped their outlooks and reactions. Now, in my experience working directly with customers and frontline employees, I observe certain patterns emerge. Specific situations seem to be obvious triggers for customers, creating almost instantaneous negative reactions. So the triggers are automatic hot buttons that we accumulate over time. Now, I originally, you'll see the seventh one is blacked out here, or grayed out. Now, I originally designed these triggers as a customer service training concept for frontline teams. But as time's gone on and I've exposed more and more people to the triggers, I've actually found that the first six are a powerful tool for customer experience design. And as we talk about touchpoint design here, the service triggers have a special place because perhaps two of the most powerful ideas you can combine in customer experience or customer service are awareness and prevention. The best way to handle a service issue is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And the service triggers give us a roadmap to prevent a huge number of issues. So let's talk about service trigger number one, being ignored. Being ignored is about a customer entering into contact with our brand, expecting more specific contact, and not getting it. The first thing we should ask is this, how are customers ignored when they begin this touch point? Well, how do we ignore our customers? Let's see, no one greets them. The phone is not answered in X number of rings or at all. Emails are not responded to. Social posts are not addressed. And this actually goes hand in hand with the first impressions we discussed earlier. You know, the AT&T stores have found how important this is. They have an interesting rule. It's a variation of the old 10-5 uh, rule I talk about in Be Your Customer's Hero. AT&T asks their reps to greet within 10 feet of the person and within 10 seconds. And they studied it, and their quote was, if we greet you within 10 feet and 10 seconds, your overall perception of AT&T is better. You're more likely to say that we have friendly people. So when you're looking at how to ignore, not to ignore customers, excuse me, make sure you look at both proactive and reactive situations. So proactive is a customer walks into our store. We don't have to greet them, but we should because we don't know what their ex expectations are. Reactive is they walk up to the counter or they call or they email, and a reaction is universally expected. Finally, being ignored is dependent on your industry, your company, and the individual. So we should do our best to understand what our customer expectations are. And a few ways we can do this is, one, check your response data. You know, check your survey data. Look for quotes like, I waited on blank. I had to wait X number of hours on X. Then survey your team. Find out where they have found these delays to be. And finally, use your community if you have one. This is a powerful reason for having an actively managed community. 
you can leverage that relationship to find out what expectations are about response times, about being greeted, about being followed up with. Use your find out to find out what the expectations around your brand are. Now, being ignored has a sort of evil twin, and it's called being abandoned. So with being ignored, we haven't engaged with the customer yet. In being uh, abandoned, we've engaged with them, and we've uh, left them hanging, as the kids say. So in what situations do our customers feel abandoned? Uh, left on hold for 10 minutes. Left waiting at the counter for 15 minutes while someone checks the stock room. Uh, told they'll receive a call by close of business, and that call never comes. So when approaching the issue of customer abandonment, the most important thing to remember is that the customer does not view time the same way we do. If I'm searching the warehouse for an item or looking something up on the computer and that customer can't see me, well, time is different for me than for them. I'm actively working the problems. That 10 minutes might pass pretty quickly. 10 minutes for the customer feels like forever. They start to wonder, hey, did they go on their coffee break? What's going on? And I bet you've all had that feeling as a customer before. And that's why being abandoned is a trigger. So you want to find out the standards and communicate those standards. What are the expectations in our industry, in our current organization? Does everyone on our team know the standards? Do they know the customer should be called back within 24 hours, that they should check in after 12 hours, even if they don't have an answer, and so on? And we want to look at the ways we've ignored customers in the past. Use the same items we spoke of before. Check your ticket data. Get staff feedback. Pull your community and design the touch point around what you discover. Now, a lot of being abandoned and being ignored both stem from the people in our organizations. People fail to call people back. People fail to check in regularly. People fail to assure the customer about the process. And once we design these concepts into our touch points, then we need to train around them, including the proper techniques and communication skills. Frontline techniques we teach like assuring accountability and getting buy-in for response time. Now, service trigger number three is one of the two that I would call a universal trigger. There's almost no customer that this isn't a trigger for, if not all the time, then sometimes. So in Be Your Customers Hero, I have a chapter entitled, Everyone is Rushed, Everyone is Stressed. And it's always a good laugh when I do keynote speeches or workshops, because I'll ask the audience, who here knows someone who doesn't even have a job and is always rushing around and has no time? And you know, their hands go up. Everyone knows somebody like that. And usually they're related to them. And you know, in my experience, particularly in retail, I found that everyone is just today, they're just running around rushed and stressed. And the last thing they want from our brands is to be hassled. Now, hassle, or more formally, customer effort, is important because it translates into less loyalty. Uh, in their excellent book, The Effortless Experience, the authors put forth the proposition that an important driver of customer loyal, loyalty is how little effort the customer has to expend to do business with us. And one of the startling findings of the research was that 96% of respondents who responded reported having high effort experiences said they would be more disloyal in the future. So what can we do to make each touch point as hassle-free as possible? Uh, I have a term I came up with years ago. It's called rule accretion. And it basically asserts that the natural tendency of all organizations over time is to accumulate rules, policies, and procedures. Organizations never get simpler without a focused effort to make them so. So start off by looking at each one of your processes and each one of your policies. And I know this isn't always easy, but if at all possible, kill it. Get rid of it. Now, if you can't kill it, try to simplify it. And if you can't simplify it, do everything you can to make it as pleasant as possible for the customer. And this is also a great place to look at data and to get feedback. See what the top complaints are. Ask your staff where they've been constrained or not empowered and have been unable to help a customer and have created a hassle. Use com your community, and this is a great way to poll and gain engagement because it could be framed really positively as if you're asking them to help improve your process, which you are. Ask them, how can we speed up our blank process? If we could do one thing to make blank easier, what would it be? Now, the next trigger is a challenging one. It is called being faced with incompetence. Now, if there's anything more frustrating than having a service issue and dealing with someone who simply does not know what he or she is doing. And when we come face to face with that, it really stinks. Now, incompetence is a harsh word, so I want to be clear what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is the customer's perception of competence. 
And that perception is highly informed by the customer's expectations, realistic or not. So a customer at a bank might be upset that the first person she speaks to can't help her with an issue, but it's a bank. She can't access it for security reasons. And, but the customer doesn't know that, and they seem incompetent. Or sometimes the service rep simply doesn't know how to solve an issue or is unclear if she has the authority. That kind is real. Now, incompetence is about human beings. So some things we must do to improve the perception of incompetence at our touch point are centered on human beings. And the number one way to fight incompetence is to train our teams. And this is training across multiple dimensions. They need to know where the paper clips are, what types of paper clips they are, and how to talk to a customer about if they are the right paper clips for the, that the customers need. And all of this comes from training. Empowering our employees is also a great way to deal with perceptions of incompetence. Have you ever, ever thought a rep was incompetent who solved your problem quickly? Of course not. So in addition to training, empowering employees to solve their issues on the spot is one of the best ways we can deal with perceptions of incompetence, but also deal with the hassle factor, that other very universal trigger, being shuffled. So what is being shuffled? It's being transferred to use customer service language over and over and over, and well, you've all been there, I'm sure. And I bet that being hassled is one of the two universal triggers. Well, being shuffled is the other one. And I'm sure there's someone somewhere who likes being bounced around for hours or days. I just haven't met them. And I sure did a study that 89% of customers get frustrated because they need to repeat their issues to multiple representatives. And it basically happens almost every time you get shuffled, right? So preventing transfer is a very challenging topic, particularly for large organizations. But here are two quick principles we can use to look at preventing shuffling. First is to try to get transferred for the first time. We will always have transfers. The reality is that customers won't go to the right place the first time. But we need to make sure they end up where they need to be, preferably in one action. So when I train frontline teams, one of the most common phrases I hear is, I didn't know blank. I didn't know that department handled that. I didn't know that the legacy customer has a separate number, and so on. So reps need good information and training on how to determine where a person goes next. And you'll be surprised when you dig into this what the people on your teams don't know that you think they do. As we get into the last one, empowering employees to solve more issues on the spot is the ultimate preventative to shuffling. We don't have to train. ever before. In fact, much of that voice of customer being expressed through social media is because people so feel so powerless in their relationships with organizations. And through the massive industry consolidation that's happened in the past few decades, companies have gotten larger and in many cases less personal. And while big absolutely does not mean bad, the aggregate impact of this trend is that consumers are faced with fewer choices and more impersonal customer relationships. So the first step is to take a step. Take a step in the customer's shoes. And this is important in every aspect of customer experience, but in very few places is it harder to do than when trying to understand how a customer might feel powerless. Trapped is a form of being powerless. So policies and contracts are hot spots that you should focus on. Look at the journey on, honestly. What we call a process, the customer might call a prison. Finally, listening is one of the best antidotes to powerlessness making sure the customer has a voice and feels that voice is heard. I can't emphasize enough how powerful community can be with this service trigger, because it's not actual power that matters. It's the feeling of not being trapped or helpless. When we engage with a customer, when we talk to them and listen to them, when they see us talking to others and listening to others, they know that they're not just numbers. So talking to customers within a community bolsters that feeling of belonging and removes those feelings of powerlessness. Because not only are they being heard, but they realize they're part of a group, that they're not alone, and that everyone is being heard. In addition, I want you to recognize that if they feel powerless, and this goes for every type of consumer attitude, but particularly with feeling powerless, we may not know it. 
Esteban Kolsky of a company called ThinkJar did a study and found that one out of 26 unhappy customers complain, the rest churn. Just remember, the absence of feedback is not a sign of satisfaction. You want to go out and suss these things out of your customer base. Being powerless, feeling helpless are bad feelings. They cause pain and they cause resentment towards the entity that creates that pain. And we want to know if our customers are experiencing that. So you can use engagement and communication with your customers individually and within community to truly make customers feel welcome and to feel like honored guests. All right, well, this has been a speed run, so let's recap what we've covered. I know we've crammed a lot into, I think, about 30 minutes here. Uh, but we've talked about nine different overlays, and I want to remind you to keep this lens, to think differently about customer service and not to get distracted by complexity. I want you to imagine if you applied these overlays to your most important touch points, your pressure points. Look at it this way. What if at your most important touch points you made a great first and last impression? You designed an emotional peak that customers would remember. You framed your communication to send the right messages. What if you had a touch point where no one was ever ignored or abandoned? No one had to deal with an incompetent team member. No one was hassled or shuffled. And no one ever felt powerless or trapped. How good an experience would that touch point be? Without personalization, without deep customization, how much better than almost every customer experience you and I have every day would that be? Pretty incredible. So how do we get started? First step is to pick a team. Now you might want to have management for the initial meeting to outline the approach and decide who should be on the team. But for this project, you need representation from every level of the company that affects the touch points you're working on. In every organization on planet Earth, there is always a disconnect between the C-suite and management and the front lines. It may be a big disconnect, it may be a small, but it always exists. You have to eliminate that disconnect and make sure that what gets discussed is actually realistic and likely to succeed in the real world. Data. You likely have data at your fingertips, so discuss what you need with your team. Use anecdotal staff input. Take input you've gathered from your community or tap your community as we've discussed previously. But don't overcomplicate it. This is about simplicity. Remember this. You don't need to be statistically significant. You need to be directionally correct. And finally, create a strategy for applying the overlays. Take each one and evaluate how it applies at each touch point. What's right? What's wrong? What do we need to change? And it's that simple, and simple is immensely powerful. You know, Henry David Thoreau once said, simplify, simplify. And his mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, in the spirit of teachers everywhere, recorded, one simplify would have sufficed. So just remember, you can make things simpler, and the greatest changes will come from action, not perfection. I hope this webinar helped you find a way to take action immediately to hack your customer journey, and to make each touch point an incredible experience. I appreciate your time. Feel free to connect with me after the webinar on LinkedIn, Twitter, or customersthatstick.com. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Rick to tell you more about FuelCycle. Hey, Adam. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it was really incredible information here uh, between the, uh, you know, the nine overlays that you out outlined there, between the uh, psychology and, and biases to the uh, six service triggers. What really uh, impressed me is how applicable all this information is to just about any sector, whether it's uh, you know retail or financial services or media. It, it all it, it applies everywhere, you know. And I, I definitely resonate with some of the uh, you know some of the thoughts that you shared. Um, and so I just want to take a few moments here before we get to the Q and A and tell you a little bit more about Fuel Cycle by Passenger. So we are a an enterprise grade online community platform. And what we do is we build online customer communities for uh, dozens of different brands across many sectors. So that's uh, media and entertainment, retail, financial services, and more. Uh, you know, really we believe that community, as Adam pointed out, provides phenomenal touch points for brands and their customers to interact with one another. So <clears throat> what our platform does is it's online, mobile friendly, and it uh, allows organizations to engage with both current and uh, potential or future customers and gain uh, customer intelligence through uh, discussion boards and focus groups and surveys and all those things all packed into one platform. 
And really, one of the big values behind community is that you're able to build relationships with customers. So this goes beyond uh, just sending out a survey to evaluate you know, how a retail transaction went. You're actually inviting a customer in to participate in a dialogue with the brand. And I think that goes back to some of the service triggers that you talked about, Adam, where it's, uh, you know, people want to feel empowered to share information. Uh, they don't want to feel abandoned or left on their own. And so they have an environment where they can go in and share the feedback with the brand, and the brand can respond, provide additional insight, and communicate with them. So in that regard, we really go beyond kind of the transactional nature of, you know, just a pure survey or something like that and move into relationship building, which then fosters greater engagement, greater loyalty over time. And so what our solutions look like <clears throat> is really we have, a, as I mentioned before, a single platform with a number of diverse tools in the platform to facilitate uh, insights and capabilities here. It's enterprise grade, uh, provides you the ability to uh, rapidly interact with customers and to uh, provide real-time support. So one of the features here is that uh, you know, you're getting both the quantitative and quali qualitative feedback, so it's structured and organic insights uh, to the ways that customers are thinking. Uh, when we say it's enterprise grade, what we really mean is that it affects every department, right? So when you're talking about product or marketing or customer insights or customer experience or operations, the community allows you to interact with uh, or affects every, every department's KPIs and, and outcomes here. Um, <clears throat> rapid insights allows you to uh, quickly turn around insights and, and events and discover information on a, you know ongoing basis. And then, of course, uh, the real-time support, where it's able to manage conversation, understand how consumers are behaving, and uh, go from there. So again, uh, really the online customer community we provide here, uh, <clears throat> you know, really I, you know pairs well with the uh, the overlays that you talked about, and that it provides an avenue for people to share information, uh, you know, to be empowered to interact with the brand, and to gain feedback from them. So thank you very much, Adam. I'm glad I could take a, just a couple moments to share information here. And then uh, I think we'll move into a few questions, and I think there's a few that have come in here. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this is Brandon again. Uh, if you didn't uh, catch it at the beginning, if you have questions, please submit them into the chat box on the lower right-hand portion of the GoToWebinar um, dashboard or platform. Um, but let's uh, let's jump into some of the questions that we got throughout. Um, so, Adam, I, I think this um, is going to be one for you right off the bat. Um, the comment is, this process seems too simple. How can it be effective if you're not addressing the needs of your specific customers? Do you want to talk to that one? Oh, absolutely. Uh, first, I appreciate that question because I do believe this process can seem counterintuitive to much of what we're taught about customer experience. But I truly do believe that complexity is the enemy of action, especially for small to medium-sized businesses and large departments. And a great solution that gets implemented is better than a perfect solution that never gets off the ground. And I, I would say this, too, in answer to the question. We are addressing the customer's needs. We're just missing a layer. For instance, there, there are things I know for sure about you. You need food. You need shelter. You need security. Those are obvious. We all have those in common. Yeah, but there are other needs sort of, uh, how should we say it, higher up Maslow's pyramid, if you will, that are common to everyone also. So I know that you crave recognition and appreciation. Every person does. Now, what I don't know is how much you crave it or whether or not you will admit that you crave it. That information is truly important for customizing and personalizing, but I don't need to know it to know that I need to show you appreciation. And I think throughout this process, um, you can look at these things as both the ability to use them as a first step and the ability to use them as a gap filler. If you are if you are doing really deep customer experience work and personas and all that already, this is a great way. It's another lens to look at your touch points. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Adam, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you on the the spotlight. Um, I've got another <laughs> question for you. How to, uh, how to identify, how do you identify what are the most important touch points for the customers? 
you know, the way I look at it is look at survey data, look at any survey data you have, first of all. I mean, you will find trends, right? Anybody that has, and I should say survey data, ticket data, I mean, I should, all, any type of customer data you have, you're going to see trends then some things are just obvious, right? The marketing flyer is a touch point, but it's not the same as the haircut, okay? The, the actual service itself. So look at the very obvious ones, and then poll your staff. Look through and say, where have we had the most issues? Where are people the happiest, and where are they the most unhappy? Chances are you'll find that they're the same touch points, because those are the touch points that are most important. And once you do that, you know, that's the 80-20. That's the idea of Pareto, which is we want the perfect customer journey. We want every touch point and every transition to be perfect and seamless, but it never happens. So focus on the big rocks first. And, and Alan, this is Rick. Just to tag on to that, uh, you know, I was talking with one of our, our customers the other day, and one of, their, one of the things they do with their community is they actually use the community with, uh, you know, uh, some high-value, highly loyal customers of theirs to identify the touch points in the customer journey that tend to be most effective, right? And obviously those things evolve over time. So what's super important today, uh, you know, may change in six months or two years from now, but they, uh, you know, they are using their community to identify what those are and to address them. Uh, well, I think that's a great point, Rick, because, you know, the one thing about survey data or ticket data is those are moments in historical time. If you're using a community well, that's ongoing engagement that shifts as the customers shift. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes to that whole relationship building over kind of transactional interactions, right? 100%. Awesome. Good stuff. Um, okay, Rick, uh, I think I've got one for you. So um, you mentioned community and engagement. Um, are there specific tips or things to do to, uh, to make that work? Yeah, and I think this question came from Ann B. So Ann, thank you so much for your question. Um, so communities are used across many different industries, uh, as I mentioned before. So that could be healthcare, financial services, retail, uh, entertainment. And so creating an engaging experience is a, is a unique process, but really what we want to do, and the, the, you know, the, the theme in building an engaging community is to make it valuable for your customers and community members. And so in some, case, some cases, that means that uh, you know, you're really focusing on building the engagement between people who are helping and supporting one another, or you know, that you, you're providing a uh, you know, first look at new information um, or like a highly interactive environment for community members and your organization. And in some cases, it's you know, finding ways to say thank you in unique or creative ways to the community as well. And so that's, a, that's all part of uh, you know, our, our onboarding process and community development process is developing the unique value proposition for your community to, uh, to keep it engaged and strong in the long run. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. Um, I think I'm going to now send another one your way, Rick, if that's all right. Uh, what if your community is small? How do you build it to a point where it makes sense to put resources there? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so if your community is small, that's, that's all right. You're starting to, uh, you know, you can create a more intimate environment with your, with your customers. And I think that really goes to the point where you want to have customers in your community to build that relationship with them. And so I think, uh, I think kind of doing some of the things that Adam and I have talked about, where you're interacting with community members, no matter how big or small your community is, so that they can see that the brand is listening. We know that one of the most effective forms of promoting engagement is to show your customers how, you, how you're using their feedback and how their feedback is affecting the brand. And so I think even when communities or customer bases are small, if you are starting to interact with people and more importantly, showing them that you're using the insights and using the feedback, you're going to create a strong value proposi proposition that allows it to grow over time. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, okay, Adam, a question uh, for you. So um, I, th I think it's regarding um, differences, potential differences uh, with service triggers. The, the question is, how do service triggers work across different cultures, for example, Europe versus America? Would those change? 
That is a fantastic question. <laughs> I, I can say this. I haven't studied that um, specifically, so I, I would just I'll give you my anecdotal answer to that, or my uh, off-the-cuff answer, which is I think most of these are pretty common, at least in Western cultures. Obviously, things such as wait time, response time, I think the timing-based things will probably uh, be the most variable. Uh, some cultures move faster, some cultures move slower, so to speak. Uh, you know, being hassled is pretty universal. Being shuffled is pretty universal. Uh, being abandoned is pretty universal. So I, I would say, just off the cuff, that the timing issues are probably the biggest issues. There's not a single service trigger I can't imagine not applying uh, to a different culture. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, now we're getting a run of, of questions for you, Adam, so here's, here's another one. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to apply the overlays we have discussed to the product rather than the service and marketing touch points? Do the same overlays apply to the experience that the customer has with the actual product? Yeah, it depends on the product, of course, but I'd say not, not all of the overlays would apply but some would apply. So in other words, uh, let's look at product quality. Okay, Product quality is a service issue. If your product quality is inferior or inferior to what the expectations are of that product, obviously you're creating a hassle factor, you're creating a service issue, you're engaging the other triggers by doing that. Uh, I'd say with you know, one of the big things nowadays, let's jump to first impressions. You know, there's a million videos on YouTube now about the unboxing experience, right? This is a big thing. Apple was sort of a leader in it. But that unboxing experience, what is that first impression when you open an iPad? So that's a product question. That's a packaging question. And I think that's very important as well. Uh, yeah, I can see a lot of different things. I think you have to look at each, because it's such a broad question with products. Yeah. But think of how you... Think of how the product fits into the entire experience. So the product, look at it this way, is a touch point. And when we take these nine uh, items, overlays that we discussed today, not every overlay will apply equally to each touch point. So you're going to look at it. When you go through, you're going to ask these questions, and you're going to go, oh, well, this one really affects us here. Um, maybe, let's say, uh, uh, incompetence. That's a good one. The, the feeling of incompetence may not affect us here because, well, it's a computerized touch point or it's something where we really don't need a lot of, you know, product knowledge or heavy knowledge. So when you look at it, I would just place the overlays across your product and say, how does this affect the product? Ask the question. You may get a no and you may get a yes, but either way, you'll strengthen uh, the touch point that is that product. Awesome. Thank you. So we, Thank you. Um, we just got a, a comment that I think is a perfect way to transition us um, to close down today's uh, webinar, but the comment came from Marlene Kay, who says, um, community is great to have customers reimagine the ideal experience, not just identify the touch points, which is um, certainly very true. Do you have any follow-up thoughts on that? Couldn't say it any better myself, Marlene. Thank you. That's a, thank you, Marlene. Great quote. So then um, I'm going to put uh, everyone's contact information up on the screen, uh, give everyone a minute to write it down. We really appreciate you taking the time to join today's webinar. Adam, Rick, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate the time. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you for having me, and uh, thanks to everybody listening. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a fantastic day.